What's up, guys? Happy Friday. We're so happy to be here. I'm your host, Amala Evanovi. And before we get into the topics of today's show, as always, we have Taylor in Nashville. Hey, 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 happy Friday. So you're telling me there's a chance for me to make the hottest woman in the world list? <laughs> There is, at least on Maxim Magazine in Australia, because that's one of the stories we're going to be covering today, where a biological man has been named 92nd hottest woman, not in Australia, in the world. Uh, so we're going to have to discuss that, of course. We're also going to talk about J.K. Rowling saying she would gra gladly serve time in jail for her views on women and trans issues, as well as Emily Blunt being brought into the news over some apparently fat phobic comments that she made back in the day when she was in doing a TV interview. Plus, Victoria's Secret may be abandoning their new woke branding and going for a new sexy look. I guess taking it back to their more traditional view of what Victoria's Secret once was. And Kim Kardashian decides to hire a Manny for her children so that they can have a male influence in their lives. Now first, let's start with the story out of Australia. Here you go. Uh, Ollie London posted this. It says, this is the 92nd hottest woman in the world, according to Maxim Magazine Australia. In this year's list of the world's hottest women, a biological man placed 92nd on the list. This is Danielle Laidley, a former men's football coach, officially announced his uh, transition in 2020 and was arrested the same year for stalking a woman and bombarding her with over 100 menacing phone calls and messages. One of the messages included, quote, I'm going to ram you with the car when you leave, end quote. During his arrest, he was found in possession of 0.43 grams of methamphetamine crystals stuffed in his bra, of course. And during his trial, his lawyer blamed, quote, gender dysphoria, end quote, for his behavior. And there is a, there's a quick little picture of who is the 92nd hottest woman in the world. Now, I'm not going to get into... A conversation surrounding the looks of this individual, which again, we'll go ahead and show you uh, what this individual looks like. It's just the audacity for me to even put a biological male on the list in the first place that just astounds me. But we're so used to this, right? Caitlyn Jenner gets a uh, woman of the year and gets an award for that. Uh, you see Dylan Mulvaney that recently luckily from a queer publication, received Woman of the Year award. And now we have uh, this person being deemed the 92nd hottest woman in the world. I don't know what else I have to say. Taylor, you certainly have a chance. If this person's 92nd, you're you're up there, bud. <laughs> oh, yeah. Put a, uh, a wig and some lipstick on me. I mean, I've got to... If, if that's 92nd, i got to be somewhere at least in the 80s, maybe? I don't, I don't know. But, yeah, who's making these calls? Like, I don't think anyone's asking for this. This is a list of the hottest women in the world and to put an individual like this like just imagine asking a hundred men lining up a hundred men and asking them whether they find this person to be hot uh mm -hmm. that's the word i feel like it's that office episode where they're trying to figure out if uh, hillary swank is hot <laughs> but, uh, but this right. is a much easier answer or should be uh for a hundred men i think you might get one maybe who maybe. would uh defuck the trend but uh, what does that say? It means that Maxim is trying to redefine reality. It's part of this larger push that we've seen to redefine what words mean. And it's one thing to be inclusive and to be accommodating of people's feelings. It's another thing to redefine reality, to redefine terms. When you redefine terms where everybody's hot or anything can be hot, uh, then hotness no longer has a meaning and we need things to mean something uh, in order for language to be useful and in order to occupy a reality that makes sense. So this is just a bad move on Maxim's part if for no other reason. Like I, I don't mind being nice, but not at the expense of truth and reality. Right. We know it's like a huge virtue signal. That is really all that it is. We know that they're just trying to say, we stand with trans rights. You're just as valid as biological women. Therefore, we'll throw you on this list in order to assert our own virtue and, and show how good we are as people here at Maxim Magazine. And you know what? 
I'm not at all surprised by it anymore. Like I said, there's a laundry list of this stuff happening, uh, you know, from sports to bathrooms to awards. It doesn't matter now because people have, have just decided that this is the thing to do. This is the trendy thing to do. For me, it hits even harder when you take into account the history of this person victimizing another woman. And probably, I know I'm not going to get too far into the weeds here, you wonder why somebody like this would victimize another woman or be obsessed with her or be sending hundreds of messages. And then you start to wonder about the, authentic, the authenticity of their supposed gender dysphoria in the first place. This seems like an awfully convenient identity to have given the history and specifically the criminal history of this individual. And the fact that it says during the trial, the lawyer blamed gender dysphoria for this behavior blows my mind. We know it's just creating yet another crutch that people can, uh, you know, lean on and specifically predatory men can lean on. And now this individual is, you know, on Maxim's top 100 hottest in the world alongside Margot Robbie. Let's just make that clear. Margot Robbie was also listed on Maxim's list uh, in the top 100 of women, albeit far higher than uh, number 92, but it just... It's just astounding, guys. And I, I want to go back to what Taylor said of this idea of redefining what hotness is, redefining what sexiness is, uh, what what our standard is for, for beauty, because it actually leads to Victoria's Secret and a story that we had covered previously on this show where Victoria's Secret decided we're going to change the runway. We're going to change what we've been doing. You all are probably familiar with Victoria's Secret. For those of you who aren't, they're a very famous uh, lingerie slash clothing company that is known for its angels. And the Victoria's Secret angels are, you know, these six foot slim, absolutely gorgeous women who walk the runway in Victoria's Secret lingerie. And it really boosted their their growth exponentially when they started running with this idea of, you know, sexiness and wanting this aspirational beauty or even to some extent, maybe an unattainable beauty. Maybe these women are just blessed with genetics, but they decided, you know, it's 2023. We're going to change up our marketing. We are going to start adding, you know, plus size women, and we're gonna redefine what beauty can be, what sexiness can be. They did a whole campaign with Megan Rapinoe, uh, who is a very famous US women's soccer player, also lesbian, also huge activist for LGBTQ, queer, trans, this and that, uh, and not necessarily of angel status. And the public responded by no longer buying Victoria's Secret by going and uh, reviewing their most recent documentary about this shift that they're making and what we would deem to be a woke shift and saying, eh, one star, one star, we're not gonna do this. And where they thought this new woke integration campaign was going to boost their sales and get people excited about Victoria's Secret, it actually had the exact opposite effect. People abandoned Victoria's Secret because they said, this no longer makes me feel hot. It no longer makes me feel sexy and if anybody can be a Victoria's Secret angel, or if anybody can be on Maxim Magazine's Australia's top 100 hottest people in the world, then being a Victoria's Secret angel means nothing. Being hot means nothing. These words no longer have strict definitions and therefore have lost their meaning. So now Victoria's Secret claims that they are going back to the idea of sexiness, that they're gonna rebrand once again and possibly abandon wokeness as it did not have the desired effect on their brand. And by their brand, we mean their profits. That they didn't get, they didn't profit off of virtue signaling to you and pandering to you and saying that, you know, plus size is the same as being a, a six foot slender Victoria's Secret Angel. We could have warned them that maybe that was going to happen, <laughs> but, <laughs> but here we are. And I don't know that they're actually going to abandon their, you know, woke rebrand. Some of the language surrounding uh, this new change that they're going to be inviting in signals to me that they won't. I believe uh, somebody at Victoria's Secret, and I'm paraphrasing here, said sexiness is inclusive and we can show, you know, all walks of life in, in sexiness and in this new in this new brand. So we shall see. I don't think they're going to totally abandon what they've done on the runway recently. Yeah, but I, I do welcome the the change or the at least announcement that they're moving back toward uh, reality. It's a it's a it's a W in the W column for Team Reality at least uh, that a brand like Victoria's Secret, which now has become known for these relentless 
reality redefining campaigns um, is moving back to its roots. And it's it's funny to me as somebody who's studied marketing and and has been kind of in the marketing field for a while. It's just it's just bad marketing when you think about it. You spent decades building up brand equity uh, by making your brand, positioning your brand as this like you said, aspirational beauty. It's it's something that is supposed to be, the angels are supposed to be angelic. It's a sexiness that you can aspire to or attain to and, and purchasing their product is a way for you to sort of access aspirationally that uh, that brand and, or not, not that brand, but that, that reality of, of sexiness. And you can have a little piece of it and, and kind of feel sexy because you're participating in that brand. It's similar to what like a brand, like a Louis Vuitton or something offers. Like maybe you can't dress like a runway fashion model or whatever, uh, but you can buy their $70 bottle of cologne or perfume and feel a little bit of the, the high life, a little bit of luxury. You can feel like you're somebody who's, you know, uh, of high class or whatever. It's that's another example of, of an aspirational brand. And they shifted that to relatable marketing and relatable is like, it's like Coca-Cola. It's like the queen has the same bottle of Coca-Cola as I drink. And so it's relatable uh, because it puts us on the same level playing field. But uh, to, to do such a heavy brand pivot is just uh, doesn't make a lot of sense from a marketing standpoint. And they basically turned their own brand upside down and suffered the consequences of that, it appears, financially. And uh, I guess it just it's it feels more sane that they're leaning back in back into their roots. Yeah, and it's interesting because we're like, ah, you know, woo, it's a it's a win for reality for like these corporations to like switch up and go back to reality, which is an interesting thing to celebrate, but it kind of is something to celebrate in a way. And, you know, we, we've seen this with so many brands, you know, throughout uh, time now, uh, and especially most recently with them just like integrating wokeness into their campaigns. You all followed the whole Bud Light thing that happened and Ulta Beauty and Sephora and all this different stuff. And uh, it seems that finally people are you know, putting their foot down and saying, oh, well, I'm not going to patronize this business anymore if you decide to do these things. And if you continue with that, that swing, oftentimes they will recognize that it's not worth it to continue doing what they're doing anymore. Uh, now, uh, real quick, it looks like we got a $50 super chat I want to sure. read. Uh, this is from Cupid's. We read $50 super chats immediately. It says, this will be so, so rude towards my grandmother, but the quote unquote hottest woman re resembles her so much. Oh, no! uh, I, I totally did not cackle. Also, you look beautiful today, Amala and hi, Taylor. Let's hope your grandmother is not watching this stream right now. Uh, shout out, shout out to, to grandma. Uh, but thank you for your super chat and thank you for your very, very kind words. <laughs> <laughs> one one more quick comment on that, by the way, Amala, uh, with the Victoria's Secret thing, with the last thing that you said, mm -hmm. it, it gives me a little bit of hope because it seems like there is the feedback loop is no longer broken. When we saw with like Bud Light, maybe Disney, they keep losing money, but insist on putting woke stuff in their movies or just not making good stories. Um, it seemed like the feedback loop is broken because even though they're suffering financial consequences and people don't like what they're doing, they still had continued to persist in it. And whether that's because because of ESGs nefariously pulling strings behind, mm -hmm. you know, behind uh, closed doors, or if uh, they're just ideologically possessed and have to do this, and even if it means losing money. But now, moments like this make me hopeful that perhaps the feedback loop is slightly restored and it's going to force these brands to come back to reality. So we'll see where it goes from here. I'm not totally like, oh, it's it's nothing but green grass and glory from here, but uh, it is it is a W for Team Reality. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's just like what they're worried about is their bottom line. And if you change that bottom line and uh, you, you do so on the basis of the things that they're trying to inject into their campaigns, at some point, if they are smart, they will respond, and maybe that's what we're seeing here, but I will not be holding my breath. Now, speaking of transgenderism and trans issues, J.K. Rowling is back in the news once more because she said that she would happily serve prison time. Now, let's read this. This is from Pop Base. It says, J.K. Rowling says she would happily serve prison time over her transphobic views. Now, obviously, that's not exactly what J.K. Rowling said. I don't believe J.K. Rowling to be transphobic. Many others don't. I'm sure uh, the vast majority of this audience does not view her to be a, a transphobe. So let's truly hear what J.K. Rowling actually said. We're going to move over to this U.S. Uh, weekly article. So, she had essentially tweeted out uh, this little board that says, repeat after us, trans women are women. And she replied to it with, 
no. <laughs> she just said straight up, no, period. Uh, that is not the case. That is not what I believe. And of course, this went crazy. People were retweeting it, commenting, quote tweeting, all this stuff. And in response, one user commented, quote, vote labor and get a two year stretch. And this was in reference to the, the possibility that at some point down the line, you could get a two year sentence for transphobic comments or comments that are deemed to be transphobic, uh, be it on the Internet or in, in person with somebody. And J.K. Rowling decided to retort back. I'll happily do two years if the alternative is compelled speech and forced denial of the reality and importance of sex. Bring on the court case. I say it'll be more fun than I've ever had on a red carpet. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> she's such a G, man. I love J.K. Rowling. I love that she's just going to, she's going to die on this hill. For real, she is. And she doesn't care what people say. She doesn't care what people threaten her with. And there's one thing of just like building this stature within your career and who you are as a person and knowing yourself that allows you to be shielded from the hate and criticism of other people. But, you know, I hope that even with the like massive career that she's built and you know all these people who love and adore her that she would be this way anyways because she just gives me vibes of somebody who is really assured in herself and in where she stands and is not afraid to be a combative on an issue that warrants combativeness on an issue that warrants you standing up and you know just saying that these are the facts this is truth i don't care if i have to serve two years in prison for this and you know what Let's let's run through the scenario if she did. Imagine they put JK Rowling in prison for her transphobic comments or whatever. That woman would come out of prison more famous, more adored, and more supported than she's ever been in her entire life. And it's because she's decided to take a stand on behalf of biological women and a real one that like truly cares about victims while is not necessarily demeaning to the trans community as much as they want to label her a turf and a transphobe. I don't know, she's doing the right thing and she'll always, she'll always get snaps from me on, on that front. <laughs> I'm not even a Harry Potter fan, I just love JK. Well, I am a Harry Potter fan, but I, I also think this is awesome. It's giving me same energy as uh, Jordan Peterson circa 2016, whenever he was standing up at his university against the compelled speech of having to use students' pronouns. And then uh, Bill C-16 in Canada, he came out and was just like, I will I will lose my tenure. I will lose my job. I'm not doing this just because I'm not going to be compelled uh, to say things that I believe to be untrue or ill-founded. Just on that principle alone, I'm not going to lie. And I feel like J.K. Rowling is doing the exact same thing uh, here. And it is really commendable. It's it, She's become sort of a feminist hero in my book uh, of this generation by simply standing up for truth, by standing up for women. And I think that's... Uh, that's really commendable. And, uh, you know, I, I keep thinking like if sh she has a certain level of cultural cachet that absent people like her standing up, maybe this stuff does get pushed further. Maybe it does make its way into policies. Maybe it does make its way into law. Maybe it moves faster in the culture. Mm -hmm. um, but because people like her or someone of her stature is willing to put everything on the line, her reputation, uh, her freedom, uh, evidently now, yeah. uh, just to stand up for truth. That is inspiring. But those are the types of people that you need who have principles, who value truth, um, who are willing to stand up, by, stand by it. Because in the absence of that, that's how you get a situation like uh, Soviet Union. You know, we read that book uh, a couple of years ago, we would live not by lies. And that that's mm -hmm. the whole idea. Let the lie come into the world, but not through me. I'm, I'm not going to allow things that compel speech that defy reason that defy truth to enter the world through me and that's it's so cool like you and i can do it but it's so cool that someone like jk rowling is willing to put so much on the line for it yeah i think i want to read this hilarious comment really quick it says the new jail tat is going to be a forehead lightning bolt <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Ed Brewer. That was really funny. But yeah, let let the lie come into the world, but not through me. I think that is such a beautiful and, and tremendous thing that, that she is doing. And man, we, we stand by her in all of her endeavors. And just really think about the fact that we are even entertaining conversations that surround you being put in jail for transphobic comments. That's crazy to me. For 
something as simple as acknowledging reality, acknowledging biological reality, and like it or not, acknowledging science, you can be placed in jail for that, or maybe down the line you'll be placed in jail for that. That blows my mind, and it's indicative of a fight that we still have to fight. Clearly it is not over. Clearly there is, you know, stuff around the bend uh, that we should, you know, possibly be preparing for. Uh, and, and with that, I mean, you will never stop on this channel, uh, calling out things as they are. And maybe one day, maybe one day we'll have JK Rowling on this channel. Hey, that <laughs> I'm just going to, incredible. I'm just going to manifest it right now for, for just a <laughs> second. Uh, now speaking of celebrities and statements that they are being criticized for a recent not, not, not recent, it's an old video, sorry, has resurfaced of Emily Blunt doing an interview and she is now being criticized and deemed fat phobic by the internet. Now we're gonna get into the details surrounding this video after we watch it, but let's go ahead and have uh, you be the judge when it comes to this Emily Blunt interview. We went out for dinner at this place at Chili's. The girl who was serving me was enormous. You know, I think she got freebie meals at Chili's. Nothing wrong with that. And she comes up and she goes, did anyone ever tell you you look a lot like Emily Blunt? <laughs> and I said, I have heard that, yes. <laughs> and she went, are you Emily Blunt? <laughs> and I went, yeah. And she went, what are y'all doing here? <laughs> and then she was like, are y'all shooting a movie here? And I said, yeah, I'm shooting a film called Looper. And she went, Looper? And I went, yeah, and she went, y'all just made that up. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't. We went out for dinner at this place at Chili. Okay. So that, that's the video in question. It's kind of, it's pretty, pretty innocuous. Now, obviously the fat phobic statement that is being, you know, called out and she's being criticized for is the fact that she called the, the unnamed waitress at Chili's enormous and said that she probably gets freebie meals. I'll be the first to admit it was definitely an unnecessary comment. <laughs> like it felt not even related to the story whatsoever. And she decided to put it out there. And, uh, you know, another thing I'll say is who even knows if the story is true? I've seen many a celebrity go on late night and just give a BS story to the host in the first place. And maybe she Rachel thought- Rachel Zegler. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry. Sorry, he's, uh, he's got something Find coming something. on. <laughs> uh, we've seen many a celebrity give a BS story to an interviewer on a late night show. And maybe she thought that was gonna be funny. Maybe she thought that was gonna land with the audience. It seems as though it didn't even land with the interviewer who says, you know, you know, and that's perfectly fine or something to that effect. Uh, now, do I think this needs to be like dredged up as some sort of like Emily Blunt is fat phobic and we need to come after her. She hates fat people and all this stuff. Absolutely not. And then I decided to look into this interview. I'm like, OK, well, how old is this even? Because the, the tweet here doesn't say how old it is. There's no marking on the video for how old it is. The first YouTube video that I found on this 11 years old. 11 years old. You mean to tell me you're gonna pull up a video from 11 years ago of her simply saying, oh, the waitress was enormous, she gets freebie meals or whatever, and circulate that through the internet now to call her fat phobic? Are you kidding me? Like, what's the cutoff for, for statements that you can now be criticized for in the modern day and age? What is the cutoff? Because 11 years, you're doing too much now. You're doing too much. Feels like media matters, <laughs> but for celebrities. There's no way you should be chastised for a statement that old. BFFR. Yeah, I think 10 years is a good, I mean, statute of limitations. I mean, it should be shorter than that. Now, yes. I guess it depends, right? Because this is, like you said, a very innocuous story. Um, but if she if she had said something else that's much crazier, then okay, maybe it's worth dredging up. But it, this is just what we hate about this day and age and the internet and as cliche as it is to say, cancel culture, where people dredge up old things like this and post them in hopes of getting a rise out of people. And I don't know, did we did we bite on it? Are we bit on it in order to condemn the idea of condemning people? for stuff like this that's so old. But as far as the video itself, I think it's pretty innocuous. She, like you said, the person was completely unnamed. No one was harmed in the telling of this story. It was done for comedic effect. It was it was maybe even if it wasn't a true story, it's in the it brings it to life in a way that it wouldn't be there if she didn't do the impression and, and give you those details. Uh, maybe 
So there are some people who are the kind of people who are just too nice to even mention that. And that's totally fine. But I don't think she needs to like apologize for this or take any heat for this because it's it's pretty innocuous and people need to take a chill pill. Yeah, definitely not. I don't know what like it, people don't use context or anything like that. Do you all know how, uh, you know, popular fat jokes were back in the day? <laughs> like that was oh, yeah. peak comedy. Like everybody was making fat jokes back in the day. Now it's no longer acceptable and we can't do that anymore or whatever because people are sensitive. But to take something from 11 years ago where, yeah, that... That would have been totally, you know, like fine to say it would have been something that many were saying at the time and then try to punish somebody for it now just really blows my mind. And it doesn't take into account that that joke clearly didn't land. Like the audience didn't laugh. The interviewer didn't laugh. She probably learned her lesson right then and there about calling a random person enormous during an interview. Will we ever know whether or not that's true or not? No, but we don't need to resurface this 11 years later to call out her, call her out. And this got millions of views. So if there's some sort of public apology from Emily Blunt, I'm just gonna be so blackpilled on this. Hopefully she stands her ground. I don't know why, but I have like a sneaky suspicion. I've never heard anything about Emily Blunt's politics. So like fact check me if I'm wrong, but she's married to John Krasinski and they put out that whole movie like A Quiet Place or whatever, which seemed to have some pretty like normal leanings as far as just like being normal human beings. John Krasinski has his background in comedy. So I he was in feeling... 13 Hours, which is a really patriotic movie and where he was a soldier. He's also been Jack Ryan, Jack Ryan. on Amazon series. So those are more like masculine, like <laughs> traditional kind of roles. Right. So I, I don't know. I have a sneaking suspicion they might be based. I know. Like I'm trying to like read into all the the movies and films that they've done to, to like figure yeah. out if they're reasonable. I think at the very at the very center of it, at least they they seem to be reasonable. So hopefully they're not going to come out and apologize for this or even address it because what? Because what? <laughs> we did do a poll that asked you guys, do you think that she should apologize for this? 87% say no and 12% <laughs> say yes so looks like you guys are mostly on the same page with us i also saw someone say that it's british humor to be a little bit more direct or a little more uh colorful in your description of situations which i can understand i remember when i lived in brazil like in the the friend groups of kids it was like nothing to call the the chubby kid gorginho which which is like you know little fatty or whatever um and that's just like a normal thing so who knows if there's like a cultural element to this as well but it looks like we got a second 50 dollars super chat we'll read that real quick can you this is from gabriel jacobs can you give a shout out to the worldwide stop the war on children rally this weekend i'm not affiliated with them but just wanted to bring awareness i have to look up what that is before we go uh endorsing it I, <laughs> sounds the, like a worthy cause the but, name yeah. of it sounds like a worthy cause but let's check it out really quick before uh we give an endorsement what exactly is this about let's see says right now in war zones across the world children are living through unspeakable horrors and devastating and life-changing consequences if this is about all children all over thumbs up thumbs up that will be uh my my shout out to that i hope it's you know unbiased and uh you know not partial to any group of children anywhere if it's for all children you've got my you've got my support um now where was I? What were we talking about? Uh, Emily Blunt. What were we talking about, Emily yeah. Blunt? Oh, yeah. yes. Uh, somebody made the, the point about, you the know, British this humor. being part of British humor. Yes. So there used to be this British uh, sketch show that my boyfriend actually introduced me to called Little Britain. And they used to do a comedy sketch uh, called Fat Fighters. And it was like a recurring series about like these people who were essentially in like a Weight Watchers club of, of some sort. And uh it's just like peak, peak comedy was to make fun of, of fat people. And it was like fat people making fun of themselves and like doing this whole thing. So 11 years ago, I'm sure that would have been normal. So please don't apologize, Emily. And I'm glad that the audience agrees. Now, I think one more story here. Kim Kardashian reveals 
And I want to hear your thoughts on this story, whether or not you support this decision or you don't. Kim Kardashian reveals that she hired a manny, which is a male nanny, uh, for her sons to have a male influence following divorce from Kanye West. Quote, I do think my household and even my family is very female dominated. I recently hired a manny. I really wanted a male around that was going to be picking them up and taking him uh, was going to be picking them up and taking him to sports, and I was scared out of my mind to tell their dad that, end quote. And she presumably had this idea because she's got uh, two boys, I believe, and without Kanye being around and through the you know hysteria that was their divorce, she wanted a male figure around, so she decided to use the resources of a male nanny. Now, I immediately, like, red flags go off in my mind when I hear something like this. I can understand the thinking behind it of... You know, in a female-dominated household, boys certainly need some sort of male force or male influence. If I was a mother in this situation, I would be looking to, you know, family members first. Unfortunately, I don't think she can look up to, like, uh, like Bruce Jenner or anything anymore after what's happened there. That male influence is gone. Uh, but I'm thinking, like uncles. I'm thinking cousins. I'm thinking who can we get in here that's an older male that we know and that we are related to first. If you can't find that, I'm thinking who are the best male influences that I personally call my friends who are, you know, close to the family, uh, the the tight, tight knit nature uh, that you should view bringing male influences into your family and especially with your kids is really important. My immediate thought is what kind of man is applying for a male nannying position for Kim Kardashian to be around her kids? What what kind of man is wanting that job? And for what reason is he wanting that to be his full time job? In fact, I I'm going to be a little biased here. I think that about like most male positions when it comes to like rearing other people's children, I would be suspicious of what the influence is there. And for her, she's got different tiers to like look at what what could be suspicious. Simply being around her family, I think, is uh, probably a cutthroat thing uh, in in her life and wanting to be part of the Kardashian clan, not to mention why would a man be wanting to be the male influence to your children? It's just a little weird to me. And again, I don't think her thinking is wrong in, in wanting there to be a male force in their life. I just think the implementation through a male nanny is not the way to go. It's just not. Yeah, I'm with you. I sympathize with the intent, but the execution of this well-intentioned idea is certainly uh, dubious and questionable. And it's tough. You've got uh, the the relationships of his aunts uh, are not are very well documented, and unfortunately, it seems like most of them are not very functional, shining examples of uh, stable households full of male influence. Um, and so that's that's tough. Uh, we, I don't know if Kanye, do you know if Kanye is allowed to see the kids still in their situation or if he's got custody at all? I think he does. I'm not, I'm yeah. not, but I'm not all too positive. I know there was like a back and forth struggle and he came on the internet and said like, she's not letting me know where my kid's birthday is and all this other stuff. But I do think he does have contact with them. Well, I mean, I, I don't know that that's a negative. Hopefully he's in a, in a good mental state to when he is uh, around his kids. But uh, yeah, this is just a tough reality and a tough situation. And this is why we kind of speak highly of traditional men in the nuclear family and stuff like that, because you don't have this problem when that's the sort of uh, world that you live in and relationships that you pursue. Now, obviously, well-intentioned people end up in dysfunctional situations and that and that stinks. But, you know, it, it is it's it's particularly bad in her case. And the idea of hiring somebody, I agree with you that it's probably misguided uh, at best and, and not going to end well. But for me, when I hear something like this, I'm like, man, this is where having like a strong community and people and like people that you trust that you've been around for a long time. Um, when I think of that, I think of my church and, and people that have been in my life, like good friends of my dad, who I admire and have been around for a long time that that I would bring into the fold if I were ever in a situation like this, or I guess if my wife were ever in it, because those relationships just become so valuable. We just have like trustworthy, you know, virtuous uh, 
male role models that you can can rope in and it is really sad that uh, Kim's looking for that and I don't know what a good solution for her is given her situation yeah I'm trying to think of like you don't have uh, male friends or you don't have male family members that you think are up to the task what is an, another solution for you I did see a comment shout out to Jenna who says a male nanny is like a male gynecologist could be okay could also be a creep and it's just you just have to ask yourself do you want to take the the chance there uh i would be thinking like okay what are some sports maybe that i can get my boys in and they have a male coach as well as like other boys that they can you know play with socialize with things like that something that could be you know like like a supervised uh environment i would think but i have like such a hot take on the topic of nannies in the first place i don't know if it's a welcome hot take i'm gonna throw it out there anyways i'm so anti-nanny at least for my own personal life like when i have kids there will be there's not going to be like a a babysitter who's outside of the family or a nanny who is outside of the family and it's not that i don't think that both men and women can do that job and do it properly it's just to say that odds are like nobody raises your kids like you raise your kids nobody treats your kids as you treat your kids and uh, you just always run the risk of having a less than ideal person take on that position whether they are male or female um, now, would I prefer out of the two categories, a woman to do that job if I was looking for that job? Absolutely. hundred uh, percent. And, you know, I think that's just logical and people can, you know, be upset about that or whatever. Uh, I'm not saying men are incapable. I'm just saying it's not the first place I would go if I was looking to uh, hire for for that position. But, yeah, it's it's tough to figure out what exactly you would do. In, in a case like this, which is why it's so important that when you are choosing the man that you are supposed to have children with and spend the rest of your life with, that you really choose uh, with just like the utmost respect and like the utmost, I don't know, foresight in mind for what all the possible bad things that could happen and just keep that in mind. Y'all let me know, is my anti-nanny take, is that a hot take? Maybe we should put a poll <laughs> down mm -hmm. in, in the right. chat below. I truly believe like, I don't know, that just th crazy things happen. Not even necessarily bad things that will happen to your kids. Just like, I can just imagine the person doing something that I wouldn't do with my, with my children normally. Uh, and as, as, much as I can stay away from that situation, I will try to stay away from that situation. And it's not to discount those who, you know, have to work and have to have, you know, daycare and childcare for their kids because it's just a necessary thing for many at this point. It's just to say that if I can avoid it, I will avoid it. And if I need somebody to watch my kids, I'm going to like friends and family who know me very, very well and know my kids very, very well first. So, yeah. I think we're actually going to get into Super Chats. All right. And the poll is up about nannies. I didn't know how to word it exactly. It says, do you agree <laughs> with Amala about never wanting to hire nannies? So, so far, it looks like 75% of you agree. 25% yes. I think the, the audience is a little biased just to agree with you on everything. Okay, but well, it's fine. <laughs> be, try to be unbiased. Put your real thoughts in the comments. And this is coming from somebody. So before before I worked at PragerU, before I worked at the medical clinic that I worked at before PragerU, I used to nanny kids. So that, that is coming from somebody who actively used to watch children. Uh, so and I, I just personally just would not would not hire somebody to do that if I had had the choice, even though I loved watching children. I thought it was like the greatest thing. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think for what it's worth, I think I'm probably mostly in agreement with you. At least it wouldn't be my first choice. Like we're blessed now, like since moving to Tennessee, we have family nearby, uh, my brother and, and his wife, and and they've got kids and they've already offered whenever we have kids <laughs> to watch them and stuff. So that's awesome. That's and that was cute. a big reason uh, why we want to come out here. Uh, I wouldn't maybe give it a hard and fast no, just because who knows if you really, really know someone well and know their values and trust them and everything like that. And right. uh, it could be an option, but I do sympathize with the overall sentiment. Uh, now let's get into super chats. First one today is from Daniel Santana, who just says, hello. Hello. One word. Hello. <laughs> with a period at the end. Love that. Thank We're you, straight Daniel. to the point. And I think that came in during the countdown. So he was all over it. Yeah. Um, but happy Friday to you. <laughs> 
Irritated Citrus says, this is very random, but have you ever watched Scream Queens? I've seen a lot of people recently trying to cancel it for being too offensive. I've watched a few episodes of Scream Queens when it first came out, uh, but nothing after that. So your girl does not remember the plot. All I remember is the Chanel's and Emma Roberts is in it and she's not acting because that's Emma Roberts. <laughs> and uh, I think Ariana Grande was in that show. And I think she huh. uh, she gets spoiler alert. It's an old show. If you haven't watched it yet, not my fault. <laughs> hmm. I have never heard of that. So I yeah, have not it's, watched it. It's definitely it, not a not a Taylor show. It's not a show that Taylor would be watching. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe I don't like Ransley. creepy things or girly things <laughs> or yeah. Yeah, so. it's both creepy and girly. So <laughs> Uh, let's see. Cheesecake Bro, aka Alex, says, Hey there, gang. So since I'm a straight guy, my choices have devolved to a guy who looks like a woman or some old 304 who's too good for Cheesecake Factory. Oh wow, what gosh. stellar choices I have. You're left. too black pilled, Alex, Cheesecake Bro. You need to you need to calm down. You need you you will find somebody, okay? You will find somebody. Stop, stop with this. Oh, <laughs> speaking of Cheesecake Factory, bro, we are gonna be uh doing a follow-up video for that whole situation on uh Saturday, tomorrow. So if you have not seen that original Cheesecake video, go back and watch the live where we went over it. It was a fun time. Uh, we were just like hysteric, hysterically like <laughs> watching this video. Yeah. Uh, but there is an update because the two of them have decided to sit down and talk to one another about their first date nightmare. So that's tomorrow's video. And shout out to Alex because he actually DM'd me the link to that interview and gave, tipped us off to it. Hey. So appreciate it, Alex. You got, you're getting more of your red pill style content that nice. you love so much. Um, but, you know, of course, in Amla's own words and own take. But yeah, if you guys ever have story tips or anything, you can, we have a Discord where you can submit those. You can DM me on Instagram. You DM Amala, but she's got a really big account. So I'm maybe a little more accessible. <laughs> yeah, uh, Discord's so probably yeah, the best. Uh, but feel free to hit us up with suggestions. Appreciate um, you. Guy says, I finally got to tune into a show. I normally work during all of your streaming hours. Sad face. Oh, no. I wish we could just like stream for 24 hours straight one day, just for, so everybody who's everywhere could watch the show at some point. I don't think I'd survive that, but we could try it maybe. <laughs> we need to try a really long one sometime. We did, our, our last one was like, what, three hours or so? Like that was the longest ever, the last Jubilee reaction, I think it was. Yeah. I had thought about because Pierce Morgan is coming out with all of these like Israel Palestine uh, interviews where he's interviewing people from from both sides. Um, and I thought about like, what if we just did a long stream where we just listen to all of them and, you know, be the judge on them so that it's an impartial kind of experience for all involved. Uh, but let me know if you think that's a good idea in the chat down below. Maybe that's something we could do next week. That would be a long -ass stream, though, because, yeah, my gosh, the amount Yikes. of interviews he's doing. That like four hour divorce lawyer interview on Lex Friedman. Yeah, I would love James Sexton. I would love to do that. Uh, all right. Sam says, I thought Victoria's Secret was failing because of all the hot water the owner was in. Joining the plus size game too late. People saw it was just for money? Question mark. Mm, I don't know. I mean, that seems related. I don't know about any other hot water that the owner of Victoria's Secret. To be honest, I don't care about Victoria's Secret. I've never shopped there. Your girl is not buying $40 underwear ever. So I'm never stepping foot inside of a Victoria's Secret. Uh, but it's always interesting to hear about the different like brand dynamics and, you know, things they're changing for what audience. One more from Cheesecake Bro says, by the way, crazy theory I heard is that maybe Cheesecake Girl actually worked at Cheesecake Factory and was possibly embarrassed to be seen with her date there. I don't think that that's the case. I don't think that we'll find out more tomorrow. We'll find out more tomorrow. We need a, We needed the conspiracy theory noise again. Yeah, we don't we have do. one. We da don't da have da one. Da 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 da. Still need to do that. Maybe I love I'll, that. Maybe this weekend I'll program new sounds into this thing if I can figure that out. I'm like, we'll get some tinfoil hats to put on. Yeah, exactly. That would that would explain it because it, it was an odd level of resistance. And on the podcast, she's like, "Oh, it's because uh, my girls, my girlfriends would would think it's just so embarrassing and beneath me." But, right. Right. Mm. Get you some new friends. Get you some new friends, girl. <laughs> uh, Danny Taronis says, "Hey, Amala and Taylor, I grew up with Harry with the Harry Potter books. Uh, I hate what they're doing to J.K. Rowling and the franchise. I think it's Rowling. I keep saying Rowling. I don't know. It's I said J.K. Rowling. Rowling too. I don't know. I don't know. Is it Rowling or Rowling? You guys let us know. You let us know. Um, I hate what they're doing to J.K. and the franchise, but I can't wait for the day when people realize she is looking out for women." Love women like like. 
people are waking up every every day. I mean, her tweets get like, I don't know, like 300,000 likes on them. So I think she's doing okay. I think she's withstanding it. it but it just takes, you know, like these little fringe you know, crazily angry people are really what derail the whole the whole thing. So hopefully she's doing all right now. Hammerbonk says, Hammerbonk. greetings from Germany. Uh, this is my mm. first live and first super chat. I had a hard day and I'm very glad I had time to watch your live. Love your videos. Oh. Thank you and have a great day. We are sorry you're having a hard day. I hope your day is uh, looking up. We appreciate you on this hard day taking the time to watch the show and hang out with us. That's so nice. And to send us a super chat when you're having a hard day. Oh, man. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Danke for <laughs> watching from Germany. Um, House of Haas says, how does a trans ninja, ninja fight back? Oh, they gosh. slash them. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I appreciate that. Do I, I love have that joke, do I have a sound so for that? that? I do. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh let's see. AVJR says, Hey guys, did you know all Bert did, did you all know Bert Young passed away? I did and I shed tears. I don't know him, but I love his acting on the Rocky movies. I'm going to miss him. Uh, may God comfort his loved ones. I don't know who that is. And I've never seen the Rocky movies. Now that he said that on the Rocky, I did see that on Twitter. It's the guy who played Polly in Rocky, like his the guy in his corner, I think. That was kind of one of his hype men. Ah. Um, well, but, rest in peace. Yeah, that's, that's always sad. Maybe I need to watch the Rocky movies. Yeah, Amla hasn't seen anything, guys. We need to No, like, major have franchises except for, like, Hunger Games and Divergent. Those are the only, like, franchise movies I've watched. You, you still haven't even watched Harry Potter movies, right? I've watched three and a half. Three and a half, which is interesting because I, everybody says like the fourth movie is where it gets good or like the fifth movie is where it gets good. So maybe have I watched two and a half or three and a half. I think I've watched, I, I think I've watched three. I think I've watched three. The only issue that I take with the Harry Potter movies and y'all can, you know, torch me in the comments for this is that the fourth one better get good because the the first three all follow like the same plot of like Harry's with the uncle and the aunt and they abuse him or whatever and then all of a sudden he must go to Hogwarts and then he gets to Hogwarts and there's a, a problem there and then then they fix it and then he goes back home to the aunt and uncle that hate him and I'm just like at this point have we not solved this endless cycle <laughs> he's moving through the years of school oh I my know. gosh that's <laughs> so can't. terrible also the first two are like very very childish in Kitty. The third one gets a little darker. Right. I think the third and fourth are my favorites that I can watch over and over again. Uh, but the when then they get to five, six, seven, they're more dark and not as fun, like lighthearted to watch. Okay. The early ones are too whimsical in Kitty. The middle ones are like sweet spot. And then at the end, you, they're good for like plot development if you've never seen them before, but they're okay. not like, oh, I, this is my beloved movie I want to watch over and over again, at least in my okay. opinion. But Obviously, I'm a huge, uh, huge fan. So. I can understand like the like peak nostalgia of the first one of like wanting to go back and have that feeling of like Harry finally going to Hogwarts for the first time and the food and the lighting and like that the cinematography of it. I totally get it. I totally get why people love it. It's just like as a late watcher who's never watched them before, you're kind of like, OK. <laughs> I yeah, I mean, I would kill to not be having seen them before just because you get that like you know, first time experience. It's, but do you it's, get I, do I you get the same first time experience when you're watching it as an adult? Like, OK, here's another franchise. Every single year through October, I watch all the Halloween towns. And I don't know if we have any Halloween town stands. It's a Disney original series uh, that they put out when I was a kid. And you go back and watch it as an adult. And part of you thinks like, oh, man, I wish I was watching this for the first time. But you don't have that whimsy that you have as a child when you're grown. So like there's no like deeper attachment to your child childhood or that feeling that the movie initially get, gives you when you're like nine and you're watching it for the first <laughs> time, you know? I guess, especially in like fantasy type movies, though, there's like the the magic of it is it translates you to that the world that it's in and, mm -hmm. and getting there for the first time is awesome. And like discovering the plot, like you never get to discover the plot again as, after you've, right. you've seen it. But but I feel like now when I watch Harry Potter, it's totally 100 percent for nostalgia. And yeah. I'll just throw it on while I'm working sometimes in the background just because I don't have to actually pay attention to it. But I'm still kind of like somewhat in the world. So, yeah, I gotcha. Uh, I see all my uh, Halloween town stands in the chat, by the way. I'm on the fourth one. Uh, which is Return to Halloween Town, where they switch the Marnies. So I have to finish that one. I'm probably going to watch that today, actually. So, But I love that you guys are watching Halloween Town. <laughs> I actually started Halloween Town, not going to lie, like a 
like a week ago. Oh, it's um, so good. We played like half of it, but uh, yeah, we didn't get all the way into it. But uh, I've seen them before. My wife introduced me to them and uh, I, I liked it. It's oh, it's good so to work good. into the annual uh, October rotation. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. Jenna, Jenna Hankey says, saw a comedian saying women don't like being told we look like Lizzo. So we are all lying when we say that she slash people like her are beautiful. Also, I usually listen while I cook. I'm a private chef. Oh, very cool job. That's super cool. Dope. What the heck? Uh, yeah, it's just all it's all reframing. It's all reframing right now that's happening uh, with, with things. And you know what? I think there is like a good maybe a broad swath of men that are actually interested in like, you know, the curvier plus size woman. And that's totally cool. You're into what you're into, but it's just like the, the utter rebranding of everything to like glorify it and to make it something that it's not. It just yeah. come on now. Yeah. And Please. it's the hypocrisy of the same women who will say, Oh, Lizzo girl, she looks so good. Blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. If they're called Lizzo, they would not like that. Mm-hmm. So if they say you look like Lizzo, which, but I get it. I mean, you maybe it's different context. You feel like, you're trying to be nice or whatever. I don't know. Uh, Red Four says, I remember a Maxim Hot 100 back in the 2000s that included Kamala Harris. They ranked her higher than supermodels. I knew then that Maxim was trash. God, it's just like what what criteria are you Such. using at this point? What criteria? I saw someone in the chat earlier say, who was on 93 through 100 ranked below this guy? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like, Dude, how that bad would, would suck. you feel? <laughs> that would suck. Oh, my gosh. Uh, let's see. Bra- Based Brulee says, Stop the War on Children is a bunch of organizations coming together to stop the indoctrination, sexualization, and mutilation of children. You've got so sounds... my approval. <laughs> on those things. Yes, you do. At least on the messaging. I don't know how exactly it's being implemented and all this stuff. Y'all know how I feel about like some some places you look into them and like the money you give them is going straight to like administrative fees and stuff like that. So I don't know the inner workings of that. So I can't give a full endorsement. But I can only give endorsement on the message. You're here. Uh, Nine Tails 15 just sends a super chat. No message. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Chuck sends a super chat. No message. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Yuki91 is my first super chat and live show. Have you all seen the craziness between YouTubers Sniper Wolf and Jax Films? Sniper Wolf docks Jax for criticizing her videos and for not having any substance. I did see the the doxing news, and I think I just saw an update on that, that Sniper Wolf has been demonetized, at least I think temporarily, uh, on YouTube for having doxed him, which is interesting. I haven't looked into, you know, like all of the background and stuff because it's just not uh, a realm of YouTube that I find myself to be particularly interested in. But Sniper Wolf and Jax Films, they're both huge, OG, like, uh, on, on YouTube and Jack in particular. Uh, so it's interesting. We'll see what, what unfolds there. Is that the guy who was like her boyfriend or ex-boyfriend that was like he would play video games and different, she would pretend to be playing? Different creator. Different yeah, thing? No, different, different Oh, that's guy. a different thing? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Different bad. guy. I get my YouTubers <laughs> crossed up. because But I, I saw that um, news too of the boyfriend. Yeah. And yeah, they'd be wilding out there. They'd be wilding. Uh, Cupid says, I used to work as a nanny and honestly, I wouldn't hire one either. So I do agree with what Amelis had said a hundred percent. Yeah. I just, nobody takes care of your kids like you, man. It's just, just true. I'm going to rename this channel anti-nanny game. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to all the nannies out there. Uh, Franklin says, Hey guys, just some ideas to spice up the show. Amelie gets a cat. Taylor has a parrot on his shoulder and an eye patch. Are you uh, kidding also, me? Also his pronouns are if slash BB. So I I've been, BB. I've been saying for the longest time, and my boyfriend's gonna love that you said that super chat. I'm like, we need a cat. We need to get a cat. We need to get a cat because I want a pet so bad, and I would just love to get a cat or whatever. And then I'm like, that that would be awesome. And then the cat can just chill with us while we're we're doing the show. Uh, give his or hers two cents. <laughs> so I second that. I don't know about the parrot on Taylor's shoulder. I don't know if par- uh, if Taylor's a parrot guy, but. <laughs> no, that sounds sounds messy. Fun fact: I did have a pet toucan when I lived in Honduras when I was nine years old. There my, you go. Uh, teacher uh, got me one, and uh, I kind of kept it at his house, but he said it was mine, and so I'd go see it all the time. And yeah, <laughs> that's that awesome. Was, so I've had a pet toucan, um, but I have a cat, and sometimes he kind of comes in whenever we stream too long, and he's hungry, and my wife's not around. Um, but he's a welcome visitor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I need to let him <laughs> hop up on my lap so you guys can see. 
Uh, British Birdie says, I think it's ridiculous for people to bring up things that are a decade or older in order to cancel someone. Every time I see it on the news or online, I find it silly. Also, I love your outfit, Amala. Thank you. Yeah, no, we got to start. We got to let some stuff slide, especially that comment from from Emily Blunt. It's just not it's not it. It's not it. Statute of limitations and the statute of limitations is like. I don't know, a year, if you can find something <laughs> after a year. Unless it's like criminal. Yeah, for real. Cyber Bacon says, hey, Amala and Taylor, I've been an avid listener to your show for a while now. I see your channel as my news source. You guys are amazing. Oh. Are you excited for The Boy and the Heroine? I, yeah, The Boy and the Heron. Is it, was oh, it, heron. was it re, re <laughs> autocorrected? Sorry. I guess. My wife what is the boy in the heron? It is Hayao Miyazaki's, Hayao Miyazaki uh, film that is coming out. And I am so, so excited. I will be seeing that in theaters when it, when it is here. Um, and I've been looking at like the cast of the English dub and it is star studded. I believe they just cast Robert Pattinson as an English dubber on that, that film. So, so very excited to see that movie. Y'all know I love Hayao Miyazaki. When it's something I don't know what it is, it's usually either musical theater or <laughs> the Miyazaki yeah, anime stuff. That's exactly <laughs> exactly right. But that's awesome. Thanks for watching Cyber Bacon. British Birdie again says that to add to my first super chat in 10 years, someone could easily have learned and changed their views or learned from the mistake. It isn't fair to bring up something they said from so long ago. 100%. That's why this is not about progress. They say it's about progress and accountability. No, it's not. No, it's not because you're... The very idea of bringing up an 11 year old video negates that somebody could have progressed outside of what they said 11 years ago. Crazy. Uh, Danny Torrones says, yes, I love the Halloween Town movies. I still feel like that magic when I see it, but That's I can so be childish good. at times. It's so good. That's what it's all about. Can't we all be childish? Dude, I, I love going back and just watching old Disney movies and some of the stuff that I watched as a kid that I'm like, oh, my gosh, this I, I, I now think about how much TV influenced uh, our generation because it was really like if you think about it, the amount of time some of us probably spent watching TV and Disney and stuff like that. It's like it's it's like a nanny. It's like a third a third influence in our lives. And going back and watching Halloween Town in the first one, Marnie, who is like the main character who finds out she's she's a witch. Spoiler alert, whatever you guys it's been years. Okay. And she goes like, mom, I'm 13. That means that I should be able to make decisions for myself now. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Who wrote this? Who wrote that a 13 year old should be able to make decisions for herself? And her, her decision that she wants to make is that she wants to leave her home with her single mother who has two other kids. And she wants to go to Halloween town with her grandma. And at 13 years old, she's like, I'm old enough to make decisions for myself now. <laughs> <laughs> crazy but it does it does capture how a lot of uh teenagers feel and i think yeah. that that's where it, it's relatable to them but yeah i mean I'm, the writing on a lot of these movies like these old school movies is crazy. often cringe especially by today's standards but there's like a wholesomeness to it that is just lost on most content today uh so yeah my kids will definitely be watching more 90s era stuff 100 uh, anything from this day and age right um uh, Cheesecake Bro again says, I'm just being bombastic, Amala. I'm not totally blackpilled yet. LOL. Thanks for the shout out. I obviously enjoy the red pill content you guys talk about. Awesome. Yeah, no, we, we know you'll find the one, Alex. Uh, and when it when it comes, I'm sure you'll leave a super chat about it. So <laughs> mm -hmm. We're excited for the day that we have a super chat from Alex and he's gotten engaged to his Asian or Latina <laughs> girlfriend. Big boy Latina. We'll, we'll, we'll come to the wedding and shoot a vlog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Maggie Height just sends a little fox emoji that says, Hiya. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Britt M says, Hey, Amal and Taylor, love what you guys do. I've been watching your videos for a long time and I'm a huge fan. I live in California and work in psychiatry, so it's nice to watch people who live in reality. Dope. Love to have you. That's awesome. Cool jobs. Everybody's got cool occupations and just like random random jobs all over the place in our chat leave your occupation in the chat we've never done that before what mm. do you guys do for work that's interesting yeah i'm really curious uh nine tails 15 again says meant to say something with my first super chat love the show i always look forward to the live stream as i get ready for work keep oh, awesome. up the good work thank you appreciate it drop your occupation you're getting ready for what? work yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly what you getting ready to do uh, uh, 
Marlana M says, hey, guys, I'm so excited to finally catch you live. Love your take on the issues. Oh, Taylor loved you. the Tennessee map. I grew up there and think it is a great piece of decor. Why, thank you. It is actually a Lord of the Rings stylized map that wow. uh, a fellow Lord of the Rings fan gifted Amazing. me once upon a time. Uh, and then the other one back there is a map of the city of Belo Horizonte, which is where I lived when I lived in Brazil when I was like 12, 13, 14 years old. So you guys yeah. are just getting all the random trivia about me today, <laughs> about my pet chickens and places up there. Yeah, we're learning stuff. <laughs> the Taylor lore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Cheesecake Bro, one more, says, okay, guys, who's worse? Delusional Oyster Girl or Cheesecake 304? Well, I'm not getting my hair cut right now. I'm getting my hair cut right now. And even my stylist was like, did you hear about that Oyster Girl? She's like, <laughs> four plates is too much. Oh, my gosh. Words getting around about Oyster Girl, man. I think I'd rather go out with Cheesecake Girl if I was a man. I think she can she can at least learn. I think I saw during the original video, she was starting to like come around. And then at the end of the video was like, oh, well, we can still go on the date. And then he's like, nah, you're going to go home, which means she was learning from her experience. So I'll take Cheesecake Girl, uh, Oyster Girl. I could never. Also, I saw somebody just drop in the chat. I'm a nanny, LOL, for your occupation. <laughs> Oh, oh, it's whoops. so funny. Nanny Wrong Slander. This is to. Nanny Slander today. I'm sure you're a great <laughs> Savage. nanny. Savage. Uh, Christopher Alcine says, when the British host of the Olympics, uh, Rowling's works were featured in the pregame show. She's virtually uncancelable, but entertaining to watch them try. She is uncancelable. That's the thing. What a, what a, what a thing to be in this life, uncancelable. I do like, too, that I forget exactly what she said, but she said something to the effect of, like, I welcome this. Like, let's go. If this, if they're going to come after me for this, like bring it. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, that kind of maybe speaks to, uh, she, not, I don't want to say she's like bored at this stage in her life, but it excites her to have the opportunity to take part in this heroic battle against, uh, what she deems to be sort of a, a tyrannical effort to control people's language and suppress truth and so i think it's cool that that energizes her to jump at that opportunity and i think maybe some of that courage is what comes through in the books in her characters love harry potter yeah i mean i think uh, about that a lot once you reach a certain like level of celebrity the threshold for like excitement in life probably gets so much higher to where yeah. like normal things just don't stimulate the brain anymore so she's probably welcoming this just like come at me bro <laughs> totally, totally come at me and speaking of Harry Potter, Will Davies says, PSA on Harry Potter, don't watch the movies, read the books. Yeah. Sounds like my wife. Uh, you can't effectively condense a novel into one movie. This becomes a bigger problem as the series goes on and the novels get longer and more mature. Yeah, you know, when I was listening to the uh, the Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, that uh, podcast that they did about all of everything that's happened with her, uh, I think by the Free Press, um, I there was quotes read from the Harry Potter novels and I'm like this sounds nothing like what I watch when I watch the movie it sounds like so much more deep and universal and like you know an actual indictment on the human condition and stuff like that so I'm like oh, maybe I need to read the books but there's just so many of them once you're like <laughs> late to the franchise it's just like a heavy undertaking. Yeah, I've had the reverse experience where, uh, first of all, I wasn't allowed to watch or read Harry Potter when I was a kid. So when I became of a certain age, mm. I I don't remember when, but I, I got wind of one of the movies and watched it. And I was like, this is kind of cool. And then I don't know. I don't remember when I actually got into them, but I ended up watching all the movies and really enjoying them. I think I caught up as they were being released toward the end. And so I was actually like got to see the last couple in the theaters and nice. really loved it. But then when I later read uh, read the books or listen to the audiobooks is what I do. It was like really delightful because I'm like, wow, I already like the movies, but there's so much more details <laughs> that I never knew. And I can't right. believe it. And you get, it's like having that joy of discovery all over again. So I could see if you've read the books first and then watch the movies, you'd be like, ah, the movies suck. But uh, for me, I had the opposite experience. So right. I think That's it awesome. goes either way. That's fun. Uh, Oatmeal says, just wanted to say, I love your channel. And what's your favorite scary movie? I don't like scary movies, yeah, so uh, I don't know that I can give you a favorite as I don't view them that way. Uh, favorite scary movie. I'd like to think I, I don't even go and revisit scary movies that much. That's how much I don't like the, the genre. Uh, let's see. Orphan. Orphan's a good one. Uh, the Stepfather. I just think that one's kind of cheesy and funny. But uh, yeah, Orphan or The Stepfather. Those would be my, mm. my two answers. Although I don't have, you know, a wide swath to choose from. 
when it comes to yeah, scary I don't movies. like my wife likes Stephen King and likes scary movies and stuff. I'm just not into them at all. Yeah. Um. I I do like like I Am Legend, World War Z, kind of like the suspenseful thriller, thriller. like zombie apocalypse those type movie. Good like too. I really like those. Shutter Island is another one. There's like a mystery or Zodiac, like those types of movies. Mm -hmm. are, those are like my favorite. But once you get over in the line where it's like just about trying to like jump, make right. you jump or gets into like weird, demonic, crazy stuff. I'm like, nah, I'm out. Oh, actually, um, I can answer. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Does Midsummer count as a as a scary movie? It. Midsummer or Hereditary? Those are two A24 films. I thought those were pretty good when I watched them. But my metric for being scared, you know, like the R.L. Stein Goosebumps movies <laughs> and shows that they put out for kids and stuff. That scares me. That scares me. I don't like watching it, especially the doll one where they do like their take on like an American girl doll or whatever. And that uh, absolutely not. I hate those, <laughs> but I can go and rewatch them. I think they're funny. Yeah. Have you watched uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark, the Nickelodeon show? No, That's but I, ha I know it's like old school kind of nostalgia Same. core yeah. type stuff. I couldn't watch that as a kid when I was supposed to, but now I can go back and watch those. And I'm like, okay, I can deal with this level of like <laughs> scary, scary. Uh, Yuki 91 says sniper wolf is the YouTuber who would have her boyfriend play video games and she would pretend to be the one playing Jack yeah. created an Alexander Hamilton parody parody. Yeah. So it I was, was her. S sniper wolf is the girl, right? But the boyfriend is oh, not Jack is what, guy. yeah. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I, I did hear all of this stuff about her, her pretending to play the games and everything. And I'm like, dang, that is a genius, genius scheme. And she was probably one of the first people to actually do that and do it super, super successfully. Um, but yeah, damn, that sucks. It sucks if you're like a guy watching this girl and you're like, Sniper Wolf's so hot. She knows how to play video games and the whole time the guy that she's with is like playing oh, video dude. games. Oh, what a... What it's a like Andrew Tate <laughs> energy. Like you're talking to one of these cam models and then you're actually chatting with Andrew Tate. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. It's like, oh my God. <sighs> Rough, uh, dude. Rough to news. To me, the, the bigger impressive scheme is how that guy ended up dating sniper wolf because he Ew. does not appear to be in the same universe no. as her and yet landed her so you i never don't know, know so guys. many mind-blowing things these know. days <laughs> he's the pete davidson of youtube <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, nortrum says i'm just gonna drive by and let that one pass yeah <laughs> um, the only thing worse than digging for dirt on people is digging for dirt on dead people. I remember how you covered Judy Garland wearing blackface. They did the same with John Wayne in 2020. I know. It's so dumb. Like, leave him be. Let him rest, dude. Crazy. Yuki again says, also is the tattoo on your arm Haku from Spirited Away? It is Haku from Spirited Away. One of my favorite characters to ever exist uh, in in all of eternity. So, yeah, that is my, that's my tattoo here. Ash One Mill says they've stopped this video on Samsung phones. I love you both, you beautiful souls. Stop this video? What video? Who? I Who? Me? <laughs> is her Samsung not working? I don't, I don't know. know. That doesn't seem correct. <laughs> Get you an iPhone. Just kidding. We don't endorse them. They haven't we paid don't. us yet. Um, Cheesecake Bro again says, if I ever do get married, I'll invite you guys, but you might be waiting a long time. Not going to lie. If she's not Asian or Lat Latina, it's a no go. Oh my right. gosh. You're bound to be <laughs> You'll wrong. You'll be waiting longer for that attitude. Yeah. Yeah. You're bound to be wrong, Alex. Oh dear. Um, okay. Is that my last one here? No, Oatmeal you've got more. Says, I don't watch scary movies either, but one I think you'd like is fall. It's not superstitious, superstitious scary, but it's still really cool. Okay. Maybe I do need to branch out. Keep I don't know that. if I can, though. Check I don't like out. the energy that scary movies give me. Like, why in my free time do I want to think of, like, murder and ghosts and gore and kidnappings and stuff like that? Like, it doesn't energize me in any way. It doesn't make me feel good. And, in fact, I feel like it just, like, gives me negative, you know, intrusive thoughts. So it's not for me. Also, did you read Christopher's? Christopher Alcott? Uh, I got that ready. Okay. Uh, it says, I want to read the GOT books, Game of Thrones books, before watching the show. Same with La Reina del Sur and the telenovela. Mm. You guys should have a book list like Oprah or Obama. Maybe we should, like whenever like seasonal things come up or books or podcasts, maybe we should make our like our top tens or something and maybe it can shift and change as time goes on. I've thought about doing a recommendation list or some sort of fun segment on the show. We'll figure that out. 
we will. I loved the Game of Thrones show, even though it's got it's kind of explicit and gory in a lot of ways. I just, you know, shield the eyes a little bit when things are getting bloody and gross. Uh, but loved that show up until the end, of course, as we all know, mm -hmm. the seasons that shall not be named. Alas, yeah, I'm a Lord of the Rings guy. I never watched Game of Thrones, but uh, it's maybe, so maybe good. one day. It's so good. I need to get uh, John to watch him because uh, we haven't done that yet, but it's so good. Uh, anyways, guys, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> if you like mm. this show, please like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time we're live. That's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. Plus, we post videos for you guys every other day on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays. And uh, our next video, Saturday's video, is gonna be about Cheesecake Bro and a follow-up on that whole situation. Will they go on a second date? Has she been forgiven? You'll find out tomorrow. Guys, we appreciate you. Drop your thoughts on the different stories that we covered today in the chat down below. And as always, if you disagree with me, duke it out, but do so respectfully. I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of nanny comments <laughs> down below, <laughs> so I'm ready to field those. And more so than anything, have a fantastic life and a fantastic weekend. Hope you get up to some fun, fulfilling activities. And with that, I will see you.